Welcome to the Dark Ozarks. Hello, everybody. Hello, Lisa. Hey, everyone. Hey, Josh. Oh, we are thick in the middle of the Halloween season. Yes, we are. And, the, and um, uh, as the weather dips into cold digits, um, yes, gotten us thinking about um, the spooky things that you don't expect. Oh, very much. And <clears throat> a quick shout out. We do have a YouTube channel that we sort of warm up on. Mm -hmm. And we <laughs> YouTube YouTube is, our, our, and our YouTube lives are our prologue for the evening. Mm -hmm. There where we introduce the subject. We kind of we, we warm up on the subject, have a lot of fun in short format. Now, all the videos, if you want to subscribe to the Dark Ozarks channel on YouTube, all the everything that we've done is pretty much over there. Mm -hmm. And so you can check that out. And I, I think most of us fall into the case that we, we watch YouTube a lot. I, yeah. I certainly do. I find it an invaluable resource for all sorts of strange things and then things that aren't strange as well. Which I, do I have a category? I don't think I even have a category for that at this point. Uh, no, so it's, it's, very, it's an empty folder, I think. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> hazy try again later that's what it says <laughs> oh magic eight ball will I ever be normal <laughs> hazy try again later so we do invite you to uh to check out the youtube channel and uh subscribe to that we also thank you all uh for liking and following dark ozarks the numbers just continue to uh go up and uh subscribers followers to to the dark ozarks page here on facebook it, it's phenomenal and and uh humbling and fun the all of this so thank you all for that now we have uh some great upcoming events we're about halfway through the halloween season or the 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 season for all of this and soon to be on all platforms. Yes, <clears throat> yes. I didn't know that we were gonna end up in the podcast business, Lisa. Well, you know, you, you just kind of, you go where things go. You you're really the, do. You're the one who keeps saying, oh, let it be organic, so. <laughs> I know. Well, I think mainly because it just started out that way. Mm -hmm. when we, there, and I, I just enjoy this process. I enjoy the mm, crowdfunded interest. Now I'm not talking about funding, financial funding. I'm just the, mm -hmm. the, 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 the momentum that is created from large numbers of people being excited about what we are doing and then joining us in the process. A real quick moment, because we're here on Facebook. So our, our prologue for a, for a topic begins with a short format live on youtube mm -hmm. now we're on the uh long format live podcast which uh you know we, we're shooting here on facebook and will show up on a lot of other areas uh, as well and then after we conclude we do a subscribers only epilogue uh, yes. at the end usually so this is this the the information for subscribers only on facebook it works like patreon it's something that mm -hmm. facebook has begun to offer it's a new feature on facebook but you pay a little bit of money per month and you get to go behind the scenes with us on location uh as well as a lot of other things and you also get to be a part of our epilogue filming where we get to the end we're usually a little bit slap happy by yes. the end of this and it's very much off the cuff it is a lot of fun we do invite you to click on the subscription option just be aware the way facebook has it set up is it is a paid option it's not very expensive but it is a paid option yes and and you and you, you have to know your password ah i never know my passwords well, so I'm just preparing everyone. I don't either, but they, they, <laughs> the people have told me that that's what, you know, that they, they've run into that. They, they have to figure out their password to, to gotcha. sign up. 
that is very fair. Well, and that makes sense. And I haven't subscribed for it because I'm doing it as yeah. You know, so we encourage you to subscribe, remember your password, and tell us how it works. <laughs> <laughs> and thank you for participating. It's a lot of fun. Oh, we do film. Uh, obviously, we 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 film ep the the epilogue. Um, that's the end of the story for those who you know the, each evening story. If you're not familiar with the term epilogue, but we also do a lot of behind the scenes stuff that is, uh, you know, it, it it's stuff that we don't necessarily have room for uh, on our regular platforms. So exactly. But <laughs> into the process a little bit absolutely so if you're really really into that um i think we're because we had them for sale at, uh, uh on saturday we do have dark ozarks t-shirts i'm not wearing mine i will be shortly because i just realized i should have put it on before we started yeah filming. and i i thought about that when i sat down too but i had just gotten home and i hadn't had time either. <laughs> That's very fair. I just walked in the door, um, took care of my puppy, and here we are. Uh, I will do that. Now, we've got several events coming up uh, in short order beginning tomorrow night. I'll let you tell them about that, and I will grab the brand new Hot Off the Press State of the Ozarks shirt. Sounds good. We invite everyone to the upcoming events. It is Halloween season, the spooky season. All tickets uh, are available at paranormalsciencelab.com. Um, so go check that out. First up is actually tomorrow night, October 20th. We will be doing the downtown Joplin flashlight walking tour where we um, uh, tour uh, downtown and talk about some of the interesting history and ghost stories that come out of that area. We are uh, doing that in conjunction with uh, the uh, Downtown Joplin Alliance, and they sponsor uh, various things, including the Art Watch, which will be going on tomorrow night as well. And they are instrumental in various uh, historic building um, restoration. So it's a good cause. Um, and you're back. So um, yes, you are. There we go. Sure. Yes, and they Dark do. They, they turned out really good. So they turned out. They amazing. will. They will shortly also be up on uh, the website uh, on paranormalsciencelab.com, and I guess we should say shortly on the new Dark Ozarks website. Absolutely. So, so they are available. Yes, um, Dark Ozarks. Sometimes there are no easy answers. And 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 sometimes it's all the time. It feels like. <laughs> Usually, <laughs> the, the the short answer is there are no easy answers that's right <laughs> um so then our next event will actually be uh, october 29th yes in natonia yeah it is <laughs> and um i'm i'm getting excited about this one i am very excited about this we'll be returning to the antebellum uh, Richie Mansion on what really is the anniversary day after of the Second Battle of Newtonia. Uh, yes. Newtonia is easily, it is a hamlet, I would say, a very small mm -hmm. village in, uh, in southwest Missouri that has largely been mm, bypassed by modernity. Pretty much. But one of the great things about that is a number of historic locations, including the Civil War Cemetery, as well as the Ritchie Mansion, remain and very beautifully preserved. <sighs> Lots of war history. Uh, the, the place is haunted. The Civil War Cemetery is haunted. Yes. And we'll be touring both. We'll be doing and, uh, and after dark as well. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's going to be food. Yes. um available and proceeds do benefit the preservation society for the richie mansion in the ground so um it really is a you know great event great cause and um it's been a lot
uh, sponsor the podcast as well as some of our events. And we'll be there doing a book signing of our own books. Mm-hmm. You know, believe it or not, we can actually read and write. <laughs> <laughs> On occasion. Mm. As the as the mood strikes us or as necessity calls. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, going to be great. Uh, of course, you're going to have, um, as far as I know, pretty much all of your titles. Mm-hmm. Uh, fantastic, fantastic titles. I think shortly before the 19th, we'll be, we'll probably just be talking extensively uh, about uh, the titles, the the research, et cetera, that went into them. I uh, will have Plague Child's Doctor with me, my uh, my fiction novel. But before you decide that you don't like fiction. Uh, just remember, there's a there's a lot of uh, a lot of real history, a lot of real locations, and a lot of real lore, uh, very traditionalist folklore that is genuinely that is is um, functional and largely accurate uh, based yes. on based on my research. So a lot of uh, of all the things that we talk about in Dark Ozarks went into all of these titles. Very much so. And, you know, I, I I love your book. It's, it's so well done. And it's, it combines all the things that I like. <laughs> <laughs> History of uh, folklore, a little bit of horror, really, even and, <laughs> and um, very well done. So it is a, it is a fantastic read. And, you know, you really are a phenomenal writer. Thank you. I that means a lot. That really means a lot, especially coming from you because you are a phenomenal writer. So that uh, is, and you are. <clears throat> Thank you. <laughs> if you would, if you would like to check out my rather circuitous uh, explanation of Lisa's amazing writing, check out the uh, uh, the YouTube live from tonight. I go off on a tangent. <laughs> It's a lot of fun, and uh, yeah, yeah, I may get myself smacked by somebody for that. But anyway, it's all good. It's quite fun. Oh, so, well. and then uh, we'll be at the website. Uh, I'll defend that. your honor for defending my honor. How's that? Very fair. Very fair. <laughs> oh, I like it. <sighs> and then we'll be at the Web City Library that night for an investigation. Yes, we will. We'll tour the library and have a, a public investigation that you all will get to uh, participate in. Mm-hmm. And that really kind of segues into you know the topic tonight of you know ghosts in an unexpected place. Mm-hmm. A lot of people would say, "Library haunted? Why?" Um, <laughs> but the Websey Library has pretty much had activity from day one and uh, including a full body apparition of a young girl, poltergeist activity, basically things that move around, uh, things that come off the walls, um, disembodied voices, all kinds of things. And quite a few things have actually happened on, on tours including people seeing a full body apparition. Yes, yes. So he does, and I think this is a, a good enough time as any, um, the, the assumption um, is that the, many of the hauntings associated with the library predate the structure. Um, yes, at least some of them. Um, there, there was a, a factory on, 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 the, on the general area where the library was before the library. And there was a pretty tragic accident in the street, right basically in front of what is now the front door uh, that involved a young girl. And it's presumed that she is the little girl that's, been, that's seen. Uh, however, some of the activity there does seem to be tied to the library and perhaps past employees. 
so the scene in Ghostbusters with the phantom librarian may not be as far-fetched as you think. <laughs> that is that is fun and that is quite exciting actually. So <clears throat> well, what we'd encourage people, of course, make plans to be there uh, yes. for for the uh, for the investigation and just bring uh, you know an open mind. Uh, activity may manifest; it may not. We just right. we never know when you go into a location what exactly you're going to experience. That's right. Every night can be different. It can and is usually. Yes. <laughs> and sometimes it's very quiet. Sometimes it is not so quiet. Now, some of the most Mm, compelling video footage that I've really ever seen was captured by you all mm -hmm. at the Web City Library with the books that move. Yes. Um, and what I find really interesting, and you can you can go on the Paranormal Science Lab uh, Facebook page and find the video, um, is that in those instances, we have been in the in the in the area investigating. Leave. It's after everyone leaves. Books that are standing upright on top of shelves um, slowly close, and I and slowly to the point. It, it's very deliberate, mm -hmm. and then gently fall over, and then slide off across the floor. Um, and in one instance, two separate books do it. One, and there's a pause, and then the other. So, yes. um, it's it, it's not something that really made much sense, other than something really interacting with it. But they've had a number of things happen that are very hard to explain. Mm. <clears throat> now, one of the things that you know, many of the let's be honest in many of the the structures that you know the, as we're doing this <clears throat> we talk less about the actual lore associated with the building until we do the tour mm -hmm. uh, because we want people to, to come and experience it uh for your own for yourself that's right there. um but in this case with the uh the upcoming investigation the reason for attending Obviously, knowing the lore is important, but that's really the precursor to being there for the investigation. Yes. And so I think there's there's more we can talk about in terms of things that have happened or things that have gone on with the library uh, just because of the, the, the nature of the event, because, of course, mm -hmm. we'll be talking about this to, to kick things off at, uh, at the library as well. So, you know, anybody listening might as well know now and give them a good reason to you know, plan to attend. Also, exactly. just on a, on a, a, a uh, just very nuts, you know, matter of fact is that the, uh, you know, many of these events are ticket, are ticketed events and a great deal mm -hmm. of the proceeds for these events go to help preserve the historic structures. And in the case of the Web City Library, uh, uh, donated funds go, ticket funds go to, in large part, to help in some of their library programming. Yes, some of the activities, particularly children's pre uh, activities and everything, it does help fund. So, it's <clears throat> really, really neat. I love being able to participate and basically give back and allow other people to give back to the community. Exactly. And, and do investigations and talk about ghosts all at the same time. It's a win win for us. It, it, is. <laughs> it certainly is. And, oh, so that that video evidence now if if memory serves on the video as you noted the books close very slowly mm -hmm. topple over but they don't necessarily slowly slide at that point no they 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 topple over but come to a rest on top of the shelves and then uh slide off pretty quickly as if someone has just just shut them, them off, off. mm-hmm uh, which, you know, and, and this is, this is also, I think, a, 
really you know important when you're doing initial investigations or you're first you know, looking into this stuff. And I remember an episode that we did way back in the spring uh, about uh, you know uh, video evidence, quote unquote, that isn't right. <laughs> and this is this is one of the things that I and depending on who you are, uh, you may not know us. You may be this might be your first video that you're watching, which is great. Um, anything at this point digitally can be faked on video. Pretty much. Well, and and to be fair, most things have been able to be faked even you know 150 years ago. I mean, yeah. Spirit photography was a big thing uh, in the Civil War period and shortly afterwards. And there, there's a ton of spirit photographs with Abraham Lincoln in them. And they are manipulation in the, in the development stage. Either that or Lincoln really got around after he got yeah. shot. He was uh, very visited, busy at one of the two. <laughs> visited a lot of photography studios um, <laughs> uh, after his death. Now, but this is where I'm going with this. <clears throat> uh, a lot of people want to be skeptical of, of evidence. And I think that's a very positive thing. I do For, too. Uh, that's something that we encourage is skepticism and critical thinking in this whole process. A lot of people, um, for a variety of reasons, really want to believe. True. And, and, and there's a, a, a wide... Uh, gamut of reasons for that. Uh, many of them, and, and I think uh, the skepticism um, as well as the desire to believe typically for, for the most part uh, are all stemming from very valid reasons that mm -hmm. I, I put a lot of credibility in, in the, the rationale of both. And <clears throat> something that I, so like, so this is, and, and for people who don't know, I'm comparatively new to investigation. I'm not, mm -hmm. I'm not new to folklore. I'm not new to just an interest in the paranormal, but I'm comparatively new to investigate the actual investigator process um, since 2018. Right. So I guess that's, you know, uh, four, four or five years thereabouts. Right. Well. And there's been a number of times so this is why this is my point that i'm coming to and i think it you know can kind of segue into many of our other topics tonight um there's been a number of times that <clears throat> i've looked at mm, video footage of activity mm -hmm. that you know it was filmed by somebody i don't know them uh there's no reason for me to know them so on and so forth but i'm watching the videos particularly on youtube and, and I look at it, so there are, there's a classification of videos that even I can look at and go, yeah, you're just, you're just making stuff up. But yeah. there, there are videos that I'm looking at going, my gosh, that's very compelling. I, for myself, would like it to be true, mm -hmm. but I simply don't know because the, the origin of the video is very much a very, it is an unknown factor to a large degree. Right. And <clears throat> something that, so, and this is one of the reasons that I think having um, regionally embedded uh, investigations being done by individuals who are there for the duration, who are, you know, employ critical thinking, uh, critical analyses, and are not, you know, are, are not there to capture something uh, sensational, but are just documenting what is going on. Mm -hmm. So for example, and this is just, you know, and <clears throat> for people who are skeptical and they don't know dark Ozarks, et cetera, and you could look at the footage and say, okay, whatever, and, and not buy it, that's fine, uh, doesn't matter, but, I know the rigor of your methodologies. I know uh, the process. I've set in on enough investigations to know that the video footage 
that is captured is raw video footage. Mm -hmm. And it simply is. And the for knowing that, because I know you guys and and <clears throat> we, you know, knew each other and worked together a long time before Dark Ozarks kicked off. Yes. Um, about four years. And to watch that footage and know that an unseen and presumably, based on the action, presumably a sentient or thinking energy has waited for people to walk out of the room and then mm -hmm. closed a couple of books and pushed them off the shelf is, to me, just incredible um wonderful uh documentation yes and in fact in one if you notice um afterwards because the monitors were set up where one of our team members and actually the library director um were watching them in another room and after everyone had gone in another room and this had happened the footage goes on it, you know it's you know three or four minutes later they come in, you know, are looking at it and set the books back up. And then one, they leave, another minute or two goes by, and one of them falls. That same thing happens again. <laughs> <laughs> and some people might say, well, then it has to be something about the book or anything. But the books had had sat there that way for weeks on display with pe patrons and everyone coming in and out and everything and had never fallen yeah and and it wasn't just our cameras but their security cameras caught and they had a they were on film 24 hours a day since they'd been there and they had never fallen right it's <laughs> that is that is some of the most compelling and for me, arresting video uh, mm -hmm. that I've ever seen. And what I, I think, again, I think it highlights the importance of knowing your investigative team. And, uh, you know, because <clears throat> at the end of the day, with where uh, digital effects, certainly at this point, other effects too, but especially digital effects and the ease of which digital effects can be done, Mm -hmm. anything can be made on film and pretty much we have we have proof of that um in pretty much any film that comes out but well in fact bruce willis just licensed his image to be used digitally in future films <clears throat> not a bad gig don't have to work still get paid i'm i'm digging it uh, mm -hmm. a lot actually good plan I uh, know, I know. I will be licensing myself shortly. <laughs> uh, but in that in that vein, if you are closely connected, if you know the people involved, you don't have to be, you know, too terribly empathic to understand whether or not the people that you're working with or connected with or associating yourself with are making things up or if they are applying a, a you know appropriate rigor to investigations that's true <laughs> that's true <laughs> <laughs> and then at that point it's you know the the proof is simply there um, mm -hmm. and and i think that's a wonderful a wonderful aspect of this and <clears throat> then at that point for folks who are very either critical uh you know highly highly skeptical or very uncomfortable with the idea of the supernatural the paranormal then guess what guys you're gonna have to think about some things that you might rather you didn't that's life though that happens uh, to so many things <laughs> in life <laughs> it is it can be very uncomfortable um at, at times and mm -hmm. and and i think as we're you know we're talking about investigations and we're, we're going to go on here with a number of location haunted locations that are hauntings out of place or, or hauntings where you least expect them that on the on the side 
on, on the opposing side of folks who really, really, really want to believe, <clears throat> it's okay, you know. Um, and there are many people who will validate your experiences. I think that uh, something that oftentimes spurs uh, an intense desire to believe or associate themselves with the paranormal is that they've had an experience or more than one experience that uh, has made them feel almost isolated from quote unquote normal society. Yes, that, that <laughs> does happen. Although I, th I think, I think the stigma is going away more and more. I do too. I really do. And at this point, I think the individuals who do the stigmatization uh, are, are pooling into a minority. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's, <clears throat> you know, and fortunately we are moving into, into the realm that people don't feel uh, if they've experienced a haunting, they, they don't feel that talking about it will necessarily jeopardize their standing in society. Exactly. Well, it, it's kind of funny you say that because this afternoon, you know, of course, a lot cooler today. And I, I was out running some errands and I, I actually have my uh, Paranormal Science Lab hoodie on. And I was, wa I was walking through a store and uh, it hit me that you know, people glancing over, seeing my hoodie and everything and not giving a second look um, happens a lot more now than when I started. It used to be they'd, they'd see a shirt or a hoodie and, you know, you, you, they'd look at you like you had, a, you know, an antenna growing out of your forehead or something. Sometimes we yeah. don't get that too much anymore. No. And... <clears throat> some people are and understandably so still reticent about sharing their personal experiences mm -hmm. uh, but but again the, the number of individuals who feel afraid to do so is shrinking and i think that's a very very positive development it really is and i and i do have to say that you know i have and i know alex has and other investigators been stopped a number of times over the years uh sometimes in the most odd places you know for people you know seeing a shirt or, or or coat and saying can i tell you my story you know i you know anywhere from seeing in a restaurant while i'm eating people coming over to while i'm pumping gas or just anything in between and so um you know i I'm, I'm very honored that uh, we get to fill that role 100% 100 percent now jumping well, into I think you've gotten that some too now that that people associate you with with the spooky with our, topic with, yes exactly and i love it uh yeah with it, explain to folks what i do in terms of dark ozarks and many times they will say can i tell you what happened to me mm -hmm. and it's amazing the number of people who have had those experiences it's I, it, it really I, is. And, and there's a number of, that have had them in places that they don't expect. So let's talk about fast food. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Mm. Specifically a fast food restaurant um, that you've done some investigative work in regards to. Uh, just, you know, sort of a survey uh, type work and people telling us stories um, is of a major chain. I probably probably shouldn't say the name in case they might be upset, but yeah. the story it comes to it, but it's 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 a fast food chain. You all know. Everyone mm -hmm. knows. You all been to it. Um, but um, and, and, and this particular out. location is in the Ozarks. Yeah. It is. We'll narrow it down that much just <clears throat> to tie it together, but prevent anybody from getting thrown under the bus. Anyone being thrown under the bus or us being sued. So, yeah, um, <laughs> small minor details. <laughs> <laughs> but um, it, it started out actually um, 
eating there and employees figuring out what what we did and started talking and literally with well you know the, you know it's haunted the building's haunted and i'm expecting some sort of story about something that happened before the building was built or anything you know this is not a building that's been there a hundred years that kind of thing yeah and so literally get well okay so where 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 do you see things or hear things it's mainly around the soda fountain and i'm thinking okay that seems a little odd uh and uh so I asked, do you have any idea who it might be? Oh, we know exactly who it is. Um, <laughs> and, and he's the reason the soda fountain's there. It didn't used to be there. It, you know, it was over there, you know, in a corner or something before. And, and I stopped and thought, and I remember, yeah, they, they did change it around. I hadn't thought about it. And what had happened is a regular customer who came in every day to eat lunch had passed away in a booth. And so many things happened in that booth. Later they said people who would sit in the booth would have experiences and, and be touched and so forth and get freaked out to the point that they literally moved the soda machine to that space and rearranged that side of the tables. <laughs> wow. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so you just, you just don't know. You, you don't know. And that, that was one that, that, Literally, I, I was definitely not expecting. And apparently people who had sat in that booth got things they hadn't expected either. So. <laughs> and now we have a haunted soda fountain. And now we have a haunted soda fountain. <laughs> <laughs> and I think about that every time I fill a drink there. <laughs> Hi, George. <laughs> just get some was... Sprite. <laughs> Excuse me, I just need to get a lid. <laughs> Yeah, <clears throat> very, very true. And again, I think, you know, it, it can be very unsettling, but it is bringing, bringing this into the normal and bringing it into essentially the, the everyday. It is. And, you know, and another thing, you know, that the employees would say basically was that in some ways it was comforting to them um, because it, it it was someone that they had rapport with and it was comforting to the to them that he was there mm -hmm. <clears throat> and that is that is uh you know one of the positive sides we do have let's face it as a society at large and certainly for a variety of personal reasons we typically have a fear of death and yes. And consequently, if you're the dead, if you, you know, believe in such things, and... I do believe that there are dead people. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> they do indeed exist. Uh, they did just dissipate upon death. <laughs> um, but, uh, but a fear of the, mm, the other world. Yes. And <clears throat> stepping into a sense of normalcy that in so many cases, not all, but in so many cases, a, a sentient haunting is basically just that person. If that person was a uh, was somebody that you enjoyed their company and and you know appreciated and enjoyed having around in life, not a lot has changed, and that can be a very comforting aspect. And and that's that's pretty much how how employees described it. Which is great. <clears throat> now, we had a great experience over the weekend. Mm -hmm. uh, we got to be at the, the BFW Post in Joplin. And, <clears throat> um, and, and this is another location that many times when you say, you know, oh, the, the BFW Post in Joplin is haunted, people go, really? Yeah. 
and and again in 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 this instance too i think it's in part the building itself people look at and realize well i mean it's it's been there a good time now but it's it's not you know a hundred year old um you know creepy looking building you know gothic looking or you know you know mysterious lodge type building or anything it is a metal building it is a a comparatively modern uh very uh, practical mm -hmm. uh metal building <clears throat> and there is a lot of activity that takes place there yes um and and again it, it, this may it, it does seem that there are layers involved um because there, there does seem to be activity that would be related to past members of the post mm -hmm. uh, but uh, and to be to be frank i had heard some i had heard vaguely that that you know i I knew there had been something on the ground before, but I didn't know a lot of detail until we really started looking into this. And then you find out that the past history of the land makes a lot of sense for there to be activity, specifically that there was a dance hall there in the early 20th century. Right. <clears throat> and as a general rule, so I mean, things that we can we can pretty safely surmise doing investigations mm -hmm. is in some cases like the fast food location um the haunting is there because someone passed away at that location mm -hmm. but just to add a layer of complexity <clears throat> and prevent the possibility of an easy answer is that hauntings can take place because the location was important to the person yes which i think is it does fit the fast food restaurant as well he ate there every day so he obviously right. enjoyed it but yeah and uh that explains some other things too i'll leave it at that um yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but <clears throat> that because we i think it's a misnomer i think it's a i think it's a misconception that a spirit is somehow permanently tethered to the point of their death i i agree that that does not necessarily um seem to happen i mean now some seem to be more localized than others mm -hmm. um but others do seem to wander uh wander about and certainly are not stuck to a footprint of a building. Um, mm. No. And, oh, go ahead. And what happens to after a building is taken down? Yeah. Right, right. <clears throat> so there's the 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 behavioral characteristics that appear to be observable they involve a wide range of of variables. Now mm -hmm. there does seem to be the possibility. I'll just throw the wild card out here. Um, particularly with the possibility of um, violent death um, and or the possibility of a conjuring mm -hmm. that it's not impossible. We're, we're not ruling out uh, a spirit being tethered to a location. No, no, but just sort of as a, as a general rule. Yes, as a general rule. <clears throat> but, you know, I think that that there's the the misconception is that they're always tethered yeah and and oftentimes you can see uh you know a question you know a question that shows up it's like well you know they can't leave or we feel bad for them because they 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 they're stuck here and there's a big right. they're stuck um aspect and and without without necessarily realizing that <clears throat> um that a lot of that is is very recent pop culture it it really is um you know really probably 1960s and after uh, is when you really get a lot of that kind of 
imagery and, and thinking. Um, and a lot of it does come out of some movies and, and things like that and a couple of blockbuster books. Um, and uh, it makes good drama. Um, yes, yes. <clears throat> and then I, th I think that the, the human ego, our, our natural innate ego feeds into that then once we start talking along those lines of that, they, they, they have to be sort of victimized. They're stuck and, and someone needs to do something. And we know what the answer is. They need to go to the other side. They There's... need to go through the white light or, or whatever. Where in reality, in a lot of situations, it really appears that they come and go across the veil as they please. Um, yes. <clears throat> which I think freaks people out even more. Right. And th there's, and I think this is a good time to, you know, th there's a lot of aspects of the, a lot of the variables to these dynamics, certainly that are more, they're difficult to quantify because mm -hmm. we're dealing with uh, rules that we don't understand. Exactly. Uh, and, so, and I think that that's, that's really important. And, and we, 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 you know, investigator I knew years ago used to always say, we don't know the rules on the other side and it's just ego thinking we do. And yes. I think about that a lot. <laughs> I, I think that's very fair. And I, I will throw a couple of things out here. One thing I think that prior to the really heavy pop culture of, they're stuck, they're stuck, they're stuck. They're, they're, they're tied to this location. They can't leave. Um, we need to help them. Mm -hmm. uh, I, th I think something that you see in the lore prior is the idea of a spirit will frequent a location. Yes. And, and Kind of like me, going to your favorite place on vacation. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> To me, that is, I, I think, a more, uh, a less dogmatic and a more reasonable and organic way of looking at a haunting. Mm -hmm. I think so. And to me, it just makes more intuitive sense. Mm -hmm. You know, it, whether or not you can quantify that, um, it just makes more sense to me. And <clears throat> the, the other side, which you've hit on and i think it's it's important uh may ruffle some feathers but i think it's very important is the 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 the, the there's pros and cons to everything you know, yes no, it, everything has a pro and a con attached to it the 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 pro of where we're at in terms of the normalization of ghost hunting and paranormal investigation etc through pop culture means that the stigmatization of experiencing a haunting has really gone down. And I, that is a fantastic positive. That's a huge win for so many people. The <laughs> negative is that it, it can develop its own dogma. That's true. And it, it, it really has um, in a fairly short amount of time. I mean, just in say mm -hmm. the last 20 years of these reality shows, approximately 20 years. Yes. And, um, and I guess we should say there, there, there are two kinds of these reality shows. One is based on storytelling. Mm -hmm. And that's one thing. The ones that are based on investigation, investigating and investigative techniques are what we're talking about here that's created its own dogma. Yes. Um, and, <clears throat> and even to the point that tropes have developed that, you know, we, people will say things to us on, on tours or whatever, and it's not even, you know, that's a trope from, you know, reality TV. It's a trope from this reality TV show versus this one. <laughs> and, and so we now have, we have competing versions of this dogma. Even. And yes. And, not and, necessarily for the best. 
and, and not necessarily for the accuracy. I think that's a, right. a, a crucial understanding. Uh, some of that does come, I believe, from a misunderstanding that reality TV is entertainment first. Mm -hmm. And that's okay. Entertainment is fantastic. Uh, yep. But some employment of critical thinking and, uh, and sometimes, you know, putting yourself in, in uh, you know, uh, an investigative, a critical thinking investigative perspective and, and approaching things with, uh, with some humility is a beautiful thing mm -hmm. and can go a long way toward finding, you know, some, some positive answers. And <clears throat> it's, first of all, I think it, in microcosm, it is simply the 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 positives and the negatives of very basic human behavior at work we want answers we are often drawn like a moth to a flame to the unknown but once mm -hmm. we get there we don't want it to stay unknown or difficult to know we want to be the ones to know it because we want to be special that's true um and then uh, added to this layer there is you know there's a fan base for the shows and mm -hmm. so um for for part of the fan base uh there it becomes even harder to look at it objectively and critically because they are rooting for the cast on the show they like yes <clears throat> and, and they want to believe them mm -hmm. just like some people want to have an experience or believe so badly yes. that they overlook you know some objective criteria yes. so it, it, it's hard to get out of our own way sometimes it it is <clears throat> and something something that i've seen with uh, paranormal research um uh, crypto uh zoological research um uh, UFO research is, in addition to being very fascinating, it is also uh, an incredibly uh, eye-opening look into perhaps one of the one of one of the the bigger fascinations of our society, which is just how the human psyche works. That's true. I mean that that is a very interesting aspect of all this that that we get to observe. And, and you, you know, we, we all like to think that we're observing in uh, dispassionately, but, you know, we're the rats in the maze too. So mm -hmm. it's uh, something that I think is very important if you go in, if you're interested in this stuff seriously, is how important it is to develop as much um, critical thinking and self-awareness as possible learning to um and it's it's very it's very dualistic oftentimes in polar antithesis one to one another learning for example to take your opinions out of the scenario you know, your expectations yeah. out your ego out i think most importantly to to remove one's ego and say okay now i'm just observing but then be very open to the observation and well, and that's that 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 can be very very hard. And I, for me, looking at it, even in terms of being an attorney and and dealing with witnesses in court and so forth, a lot of people have a very hard time differentiating between their own opinion and what is fact. And it's yeah. <laughs> and it's often not from a a deceitful position that mm -hmm. they really are unaware that their opinion is not fact. Yes, yes. And something that I think is very helpful for people who don't know, um, your day job is an attorney. Yeah. My day job is editor-in-chief and in journalism. Yes and is, is being a journalist and I, I do think that both of those um 
professional skill sets complement, certainly they complement, um, you know, the Dark Ozarks endeavors, but they, they also are very, very helpful skill sets to, uh, to do analysis. I, I think so. And, and just because we are, we are used to having to be objective um, and not taking information that is either unexpected or maybe doesn't support what you, you initially were thinking personally. Yes. And I think that, you know, the, 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 the two things that I would encourage people to develop, I, I think is two things that the, just sort of your baseline um, uh, human nature fights against. One of them is learning to really take your ego out of the equation as much as possible. Yeah. Uh, the, the anticipation, I want it to be this, I think it's going to be this, my team thinks it's going to be this, the side I'm rooting for thinks it's going to be this. So this is, this is what the data has to support and, right. and really getting invested in that, learning to become much more dispassionate in that regard. You can't, it, I'm not saying don't be passionate about what you're doing, but uh, you know, removing yourself from the, the final analysis. It's just, what is it? What are we looking at? Um, but then on the, the, the other side, which is also difficult, is developing uh, personal awareness. We're, yes. we're oftentimes very unaware of the uh, environment around us. And so, for example, you know, there, there, if you put yourself into a, a creepy mindset, you know, we, we've all had those moments where we've been spooked out in our own living room because of the show we were watching. So the feed comes back up. Oh, there you are. There we go. There we go. Yeah. Um, we, we've all we've all had those moments where we've been like, you know, safe in our living room. There's no reason for us to believe that our living room is haunted, etc. But we watched a spooky movie, and now we're on high alert. We're we're right. We're, we're ready for it. And so, and, and I see this when we start doing tours. Uh, that that somebody say they were walking through Walmart. Maybe they were at the at the uh, uh, the haunted fast food restaurant earlier that day, but weren't aware that they should be looking out for you know uh, George or whomever his name was. Right. And so they probably you know the, you know I think you know I'm, I'm creating a hypothetical scenario, but just think about it, guys. Uh, you know you could have gone to a haunted restaurant. You could have sat down in a booth. Uh, in, a, in an area renowned for activity, but only the wait staff know about it. Uh, you could have had a lovely meal. You might have had all sorts of strange things happening. And because you were just focused on your meal and minimizing your awareness, you never even thought about it. Then you go to on a haunted tour once a year and you're like, oh my gosh, I'm so scared. Right. That, that's a very good illustration. <laughs> Yeah, and I am curious. We've talked about a couple of places I've been and so forth. Yes. What experience? Tell, tell us an experience you've had that was unexpected. Mm, well, a, a handful. Um, the the one one of them is in northern Ozark, so I'll start there first, and that is actually in the the now closed um, railroad. Now it's the Walking Bridge. Uh, or the trail walks up onto the bridge in Boonville, Missouri, on the Missouri River. And there's, of course, there's a lot of lore associated with threshold spaces, a lot of lore associated with water, a lot of lore mm -hmm. associated with railroad tracks, and then yeah. lore associated with historic locations. Now, this particular bridge, uh, it's just past the casino, in case you're familiar with Boonville, and it's uh, part of a walking trail and a, and a park and beautiful location but threshold space 
uh, lots of water for obvious reasons, um, railroad track, and simply a lot of history. It's all within that space. But lots of other spaces on that walking trail, et cetera, are also within that space. Right. And I, I really don't know a lot of the, I mean, I know the cursory history of Boonville and, mm -hmm. the, and the region, but I didn't like go study up on the bridge before I got on the walking trail. And <clears throat> for people who know, um, they know that, you know, unless it's really precarious, uh, heights really don't bother me. No. And, and you've seen this. Mm -hmm. um, Dale has seen this. Also, if I'm trying to get a shot with my camera, I become completely oblivious to heights. Yeah. And, <laughs> um, and Dale actually got to see that when we were photographing springs, just a bit uh -huh. of an aside. Uh, but Round Spring, way over by past eminence uh high high bluff beautiful huge spring etc cetera, etc cetera. um i'm trying out my new slr camera mm -hmm. and i'm hanging off this side of the bluff with my camera because i know that as long as i'm looking through the lens of the camera nothing can happen to me <laughs> and I needed my shot. I got my shot. So Superman, right? <laughs> yeah. It's it's my it's my it's my protection spell. Uh I'm also scared of snakes, but if I'm looking at the snake through the camera lens, I'm no longer scared of the snake. And I got some some fantastic shots of actually a, a, a juvenile rat snake at very close range but in case anybody wonders the juvenile rat snake has an interesting diamond pattern and when they're young uh the space between the back of their jaws and the rest of their body is smaller mm -hmm. to give the illusion that they have a slightly diamond shaped head and i hadn't actually done an identification of the snake so for all i know it's a it's a a pygmy rattlesnake and i'm like getting in its face photographing it but it, it, it's fine because i anyway that's that's me i get weird so important precursor walking across tall bridges should have no i should have no issue with whatsoever and i i bounce up on the bridge because the sun's going down missouri river is gorgeous it is a crisp mm -hmm. beautiful october evening i'm like super excited and I'm not even thinking anything about it. I'm just going to the the end of where you can walk. They have a, right. a, a little ways out and then it's blocked off. And I get out there. I'm now over the water, looking for the shot, looking for the shot, excited to be out there. And at some point I cross a threshold. And I go... And the funny thing was, I am suddenly, and I'm standing in the middle of the bridge. Like, <laughs> you know, it's a wide bridge. There's a lot of yeah. space on both sides. It, I'm a long way from dropping something over the edge. Right. Suddenly, I am gripped with this irrational fear that I'm going to lose my camera over the edge. I have to hold on. I was just using the iPhone. I have to hold on to my phone my phone i'm i'm scared i'm going to drop my phone it's going to be lost and the further i get the more just that that intense mounting level of fight or flight wow. i should not be here this is dangerous you're not in a good space you need to go back just go back just get off the bridge hmm and Again, I don't have a reason other than this very abnormal reaction. Right. Uh, I fought the feeling long enough to get the photos I wanted, but I was scared to get to the edge of the, the guardrail. Right. Uh, which, again, odd behavior for me. Uh, yeah. And <clears throat> then I'm like, okay, I need to get off this bridge. Like, I need to get off this bridge right now. and. And the, there's the, the bridge construction part, and then mm -hmm. you cross past over, because the, 
that railroad bridge crosses another railroad track. Uh -huh. And as soon as I'd crossed over the, the railroad track below, mm -hmm. I was fine. So very limited spatially. Very, very limited. And, and I still get a little creeped out, like thinking about it. Um, mm -hmm. And for people to say, oh, maybe it was the height of the bridge, et cetera. No, I don't think so. I, and, and, and I traditionally love this kind of stuff. Um, and and I'm, even as a child would find people who were afraid of tall bridges to be really comical because I, I love them. And in case anybody wonders, my favorite, favorite bridge, it's not there anymore. It's the big green bridge uh, that crossed the Mississippi at Burlington. And what I loved the most about it, because it's a it's two lane bridge. I have two favorite bridges that cross the Mississippi. Uh, one of them still there, it's at Fort Madison. A number of people hate that bridge. I'll explain why in a moment. Um, but the, the bridge at Burlington, uh, very traditionalist, early, not early, but uh, probably 19, I think I wanna say 1930s, 1920s or 1930s. It was the big bridge. Yeah. Uh, to cross the Mississippi uh, for Highway 34. And it had a, a metal grating for the bridge floor. Yeah. And so you could sit in the van, I did this so many times as a child, sit in the van and peek out the window and see the river directly below your tires. Yeah. I thought that was the coolest thing ever. So granted, I wasn't walking on the bridge, we were driving on the bridge, but still definitely establishing the sense that I don't have an irrational fear of bridges. Um, and uh, the other one, which is still there, I believe it was built in 1924. Love this bridge to just, it is so amazing. It's at Fort Madison, Fort mm -hmm. Madison, Iowa, crosses at Fort Madison. And this bridge is a feat of engineering. It is a double-decker bridge. Oh, cool. The bottom deck is the railroad track. The top deck is the driving uh, oh, deck. The, the, you go, you're the, the highway as you're in, uh, on the Illinois side in Neota, the highway um, matches the railroad track, you know, is, is mirroring, following the railroad track. And then mm -hmm. the railroad track goes along here and then the uh, the bridge ramp goes up and then makes a sharp turn to then be built <laughs> over the railroad. Now it gets better. <clears throat> it's also a swing bridge. Uh, no. <laughs> and so so you get about two thirds across, and there's a a gatehouse. Mm -hmm. And then on both sides of it are the big the big bars that come down. Yeah. And if there's a barge coming, uh, then you have to stop on the bridge. Ugh. And <laughs> this gigantic swath of the entire bridge, railroad track on the bottom, car deck on the top, all swivels out, rotates to let the barge traffic through. <laughs> It is so cool. Um, well, but yeah, see that that would that that would creep me out a little bit. <laughs> it was I. It was one of I just I I love this bridge so much. Um. So all that to be said, it is very odd behavior for me to be on this bridge mm -hmm. uh, in Boonville and suddenly just absolutely have to get off of it. I do believe there's energy there. Um, I, I'd like to do more research on why. I, I don't know, but yeah. it definitely enough to catch my attention and make me want to know more. That's that's very fair, and it, and certainly you don't think about some, having that kind of experience when you're just walking a trail or something like that. You know, um, no. <clears throat> you know, it's it's kind of like you know you go to the city park and something freaks you out, you know, something <laughs> happens, you know, it's not, it's not uh, expected. Um, no. 
So what would you say is the most unexpected sort of haunting or ghost that you've experienced? Um, my, my most unexpected, of course, it is outside the borderlands of the Ozarks, but since we're just mm -hmm. talking about uh, hauntings and unexpected places, uh, was an experience probably the first dramatic or the, the first dramatic um, haunting experience that I had which I was genuinely aware that something had happened. Uh -huh. uh, took place in 1998, November of 1998, and was in the Methodist Medical Center in Des Moines, Iowa. Uh, we were there for a family member and a situation where you just are there. You right. Know, you go to the hospital and you stay uh, for a long time. Yeah, and work in hospital, everything's, all the regular activity going on. Yes. Uh, so it wasn't like I just stopped in. I'd, I'd been there with my family for over a week. Uh -huh. And consequently, I was getting really bored. And it was about 10, 10 something at night. Uh -huh. and <clears throat> so and I'm, I'm still basically just a big kid at this point. Um, <laughs> I'm, psychologically, I'm a big kid. I'm 20, in case you wonder. I am 20 yeah. uh, at this time. And for those likely familiar, uh, possibly familiar with uh, the Methodist Medical Center, it is a sprawling complex. And we were, um, my family member was on PAL-3 at the time. It was an oncology unit. It was in PAL-3. Uh, there's two wings on the south side of the hospital, PAL and Yonkers. And trying to remember, Yonkers, I believe, has nine floors. I think PAL is slightly shorter. Um, mm -hmm. So... So it was on, and there the two uh, towers are connected by uh, stairwells and a bank of elevators. Okay. So so they, the two, uh, they're long. Um, east west tower, two you know east west towers, and then they share share the stairwells and the, um, basically four year areas with the, uh, with the elevator bank. <clears throat> gotcha so i'm on pal three and the family room where i was sleeping in a armchair mm -hmm. uh, was as if you were on the it doesn't really matter i suppose but the 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 east end of pal three which is right next to the stairs and the elevators and then it would have been the walking into yonkers three Mm -hmm. uh, and so right there where the elevators come down was the family room that's where I was sleeping um, I <laughs> I was bored didn't have a lot to do and as a general rule when I got bored I would get permission from my family and then I would wander into other parts of the hospital that were, yeah. were open go go to the coffee bar, uh, go to the cafeteria, familiarize myself with the layout, etc. So I'd, I'd done all that. Uh, it's late, late in the evening. And <clears throat> I, let's be totally transparent here. I have to pee. <laughs> and, and, and I'm tired of going to the bathroom that's right next to the family room. So I decide I'm going to just go up a floor. Uh -huh. and, uh, and and try out uh, try out a bathroom on a different floor just for a, a change of pace. So uh -huh. I uh, I take the elevator up to um, uh, to the fourth floor because I'm uh -huh. on the third floor. So let's go up one. <clears throat> I'm 20. I know it doesn't make any sense, but I was just you know stir crazy. Um, now there's Powell. Um, so I'm on PAL 3. I go up to PAL 4, which is also Yonkers 4. Okay. I step out of the elevator banks, and the bathrooms are on the Yonkers side. Okay, so I'm you have to go across. Yeah. So, uh -huh. but I step out of the elevators. First of all, in recollection, it's like the sound goes out in my perception. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not saying that there wasn't sound but my perception of the space and my memory of the space does not have sound. That's, not, not, that's not an uncommon thing either. 
you know, mm -hmm. that's not too uncommon. Um, now, an interesting thing is that presumably Powell four had people on the wing. Mm -hmm. um, Yonkers four had been cleared. It was going to be a renovated floor. Okay, so it was empty. It, Powell four or Yonkers four was completely empty and mostly dark. They had some very basic lights on. Now it was a, an admittedly creepy uh, scene because they had yeah. a lot of the lights off and they had a lot areas that they were getting ready to paint or drywall, refurbish, et cetera. They had a lot of plastic hanging down. Gotcha. So, you know, and that's where you're like looking into the floor, there's the nurse's station, there's the halls down on both sides. But again, and I could laboriously beat the point, but I'm not scared of the dark. I'm not scared of funky lighting. I grew up in a temper. I you know, whatever. And please bear in mind, I'm 20 years old and I'm stir crazy and I just want to go pee in a different bathroom. Let's be honest. <laughs> That's what I'm actually doing. Uh, so my mind is very, very far away from, is this a haunted floor or <laughs> right. whatever? And I, I step out. Now what, and the reason I, I'm really tying in on the sound, presumably Powell 4, which is right there, had activity on it because that floor that tower section was not closed the office right. section was being renovated the Powell section was not I have no memory of people or sound or anything wow um I step out of you know out of the elevator and there's just a there's a moment where it's like this is weird and the next moment is mounting fight or flight wow get off the floor you shouldn't be here wow now, as a testament to my general fortitude i'm like no i have to pee and i rode the elevator an entire floor up here to do this <laughs> so i go to the bathroom <laughs> and the uncanniest experience, very similar to my first experience at the Crescent Hotel, a sense mm -hmm. of presence around me, behind me, the sense that I should not be here. This is, yeah. this is not a space that I am supposed to be in. And, and it's relevant. This is relevant to the story, which is why I'm, because I'm standing at the urinal peeing. Okay. And every bit of my spider sense says, get the hell out of here. <laughs> and <laughs> but not quite yet <laughs> but not quite yet I, i'm doing a little busy um and now this was 1998 so now this is a funny it's not paranormal but it is funny in 1998 so automatic flush urinals was a new thing <laughs> <laughs> let's just say it was a good thing i had already peed when i stepped back to the thing flushed by itself because if it hadn't, I would have peed in my pants. Uh, now, it, it would have been a real thing. Um, I would have had to have like gone and changed my britches. Um, I, I finished. I did wash my hands, in case anybody wonders. Cleanliness first, even in the midst of a malevolent fight or flight environment. Uh, I... Basically. I don't know what you're here to, to do to me, but just one second. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I got to do something. Um, I basically move rapidly to the door, step outside, and it is so, there's no noise, basically, but just the the intense rush of energy that says, get the hell off of this floor. You should wow. not be here. Um, you could not, it was an open floor. I could have walked like if, like there was nothing obstructing me from walking right. through Yonkers and going across the walkway to the main part of the hospital. You couldn't have paid me enough to take one step toward the nurse's station. Wow. Um, I run, and also, and this is something that I experienced without even thinking about it at the Crescent Hotel many, 10 years later, you couldn't pay me to get back in the elevator yeah uh i run to the stairs 
-hmm. I run down the stairs. I open the the fire escape, you know, the fire door, big heavy right. fire door on uh, from the the uh, the the stairs, the you know stairwell. I step out, and the first thing that I remember is hearing normal sound in PAL three. And and you know that that sort of that vacuum of no sound does happen with activity at times so it was uncanny uh, i did not go back up to yonkers for that night fair uh, the next day in the daylight i did go up there mm -hmm. and i remember walking around toward the nurse that it was a very different environment yeah uh it was not spooky at all and I remember being baffled at the change of environment. Someone doesn't want you to tell the story, I don't think. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I just remember being very baffled at the change of environment. And yes. And, and enough so that there's, you know, a, a rational part of my brain that, that honestly said, you know, what were you thinking? Um, there's nothing scary here. There's nothing spooky here. There's nothing. Um, and if it had not been so intense, and, and of course I didn't see anything, nothing touched right. me. There wasn't a physical mark. There wasn't a, you know, a, a souvenir of the experience. It was just my impression of the, of the space um if it had not been so intense i i could have dismissed it and said oh my mind was playing tricks on me uh, uh who knows what but right. I, I, I that that experience and of course a couple of others have definitely told me you know in, in an intense experience you don't have to guess whether or not you're having an experience I think that I think that's fair and that you know that's my experience as well is that those kind of particularly when you get that overwhelming sense of foreboding or fight or flight um, I, I really do think it's our primal brains reacting giving us the heads up just like they would have you know thousands of years ago on the savannah you know yeah. the lion's about to eat you i mean that's the sensation you know that is the sensation and and there are environments that we step into that you know give us that same sense and yes. just because you can't see something doesn't mean it isn't going to eat you so <laughs> yes which is a little scary um <laughs> it, it can be and and i think that you know, at that point, you can potentially break it down in, into two things, either uh, a, a sentience that is in, in some form a, a type of apex predator. Yeah. Uh, that, that, you know, in, this, in the same way, if you're on the savanna and a lion is stalking you. Exactly. That you and go- I've had that okay. sensation a few times. <laughs> yes. Um, the other one that I think is interesting is the possibility of a, of a residual echo of an environmental mm -hmm. uh, issue. In the case of Yonkers 4, something that I, I actually had an incredible moment earlier this year. I was sharing this story with an individual uh, whose father-in-law was a firefighter in Des Moines uh, uh -huh. in the 70s and 80s, and he stopped cold and was like was it yonkers four when i was telling him the story and come to find out in the early 80s there was an arson fire on yonkers four okay now i don't know if the arson fire involved casualties or not uh, but it was deliberately set that's my information i have at this point i would like to find some actual newspaper records i have not been able to find anything online uh, it's interesting, it. but it, it was a it was a, a fire. Someone was very, 
you know, malevolently seeking to do damage. Right. Well, and just the the sense, I mean, almost, you know, like walking, stepping out into basically a fire situation, though you couldn't see it, but if your yes. brain perceived it as that, mm -hmm. uh, you know, let's face it, something, you know, room on fire is one of the most terrifying things there can be. Absolutely. And so I'm curious, you know, I'm, I'm just doing analysis as we go, but the possibility that, you know, because the, the, you know, certainly the first thing that people would jump to is, oh, it's a malevolent entity, it's a demon, it's this, it's that, it's something else. I'm wondering, what if I'm just picking up on the residual echo of this fire, which would be terrifying, and everything in my being would say, get off the floor? See, to me, that, that makes probably more sense that it's more likely that than, than a benevolent being. And, you know, the, the only thing as a 20-year-old that I really was able to conclude or, and it's not, I mean, it's not a conclusion, it's just my personal conclusion, was mm -hmm. something really, really bad happened here. Yeah. Well, and at least you've gotten some partial confirmation of that. So it's yes. a step forward. And I, the, that, you know, because I've gone a long time with, with no confirmation. I just know what, what, what I, what I, what I felt. And, you know, and, the, and even, I think it's even, you know, we, we I, I see a lot of catharsis for many people who come and talk to us. I will say that, uh, you know, Dark Ozarks has been very cathartic for me. There's, you know, if we weren't doing this, there, this is a real experience I had, but it's not a lot of people that I have a chance to talk about those real experiences. Well, that, that's very true. Plus the broader, the broader scope of what we talk about and everything gives a little more context too, in a way. It does. I would have yeah. Now you mentioned, um, you know, having having more of a sentient interaction. Oh, you cut out there for a second. Oh, you mentioned having more of a sentient interaction. Yes, um, and I and I I don't know if I've talked to you about this one. Um, this was literally I was walking down the sidewalk. I think I was going back to my office from lunch, if I remember right, that parked in the parking lot and was walking, walking back to the office. And it's, it was about a block and a half walk. And it was, it was late summer, early autumn. Um, it was hot. I remember I was, I mean, just walking that far, I was sweating and um, short sleeve shirts and, you know, just to give a context to, to then what I come across. Um, and I'm coming up to an alley and um, coming towards me on the sidewalk is, is a man. And I hadn't been paying too close attention to him. And I look up and he is, he's dressed in a World War II pea coat with and i can see his trousers which match a world war ii uniform and shoes he's dark headed and his he's got his hair slicked back a pomaded back which you know he's certainly out of place because you know it's like 90 degrees and humid as all get out and so this makes no sense. And he's got his hands down in his pockets and his posture is that he's cold. And I look at his face and his, his cheeks are red and he just, you know, that red chafing, you know, like you're in cold wind. That's what he looked like. And um, I just kind of, you know, it was like, I, I looked at him and then looked away and then, you know, it took a second to wait a minute. And I looked back at him and then he, he kind of pauses and looks at me and it's like, it's a startle reaction, you know, when he, when our eyes met 
and he keeps walking as I turn around I thought oh I've, I've got to talk to this guy and as I turn around he had started down the alley and I turn and I get the you know he's like three steps ahead of me at this point and I get to the alley and there's nothing there and there was nowhere he could have gone mm. wow but but it um the the thing of it is is that it wasn't that I just saw something and he and what passed it he reacted to me <clears throat> yes know? yes oh that's incredible yeah, but yeah, he looked like he was freezing cold. His face looked like he was in, you know, a cold wind, you know, and and his posture with his hands in his coat and and just just looked like he was trying to keep himself warm. Yes. Mm. Oh. I have I have no explanation, you know. You know, right theoretically it could be it could have been a person he, he looked as real as anybody yeah but there there was no where he could have gone in that amount mm -hmm. of two three seconds that yeah. he was out of sight that and then disappear and it really it really brings to mind just those those questions of that some ghosts may be an intersection in time Yes, but the sense I got was the look on his face was like he'd been, you know, oh no, you're not supposed to see me, or I've been seen, I'm not supposed to. Yes. You know, that was the that was the mm -hmm. sense of the re his reaction. And then he's quickened to step and, and turn the corner real quick. Wow. Mm. There's a lot of a lot of unanswered questions with that experience. Was that yeah. uh, was that in Joplin? It was in Joplin. Um, and while certainly, I mean, that part of town, there could have, you know, certainly are, are hauntings, but nothing I can explain that for. And certainly, you know, nothing that was expected. I was just walking back from the car to go, you know, walking back from lunch. Yeah. Um, thinking about how hot it, I, I literally was thinking about how hot it was it was so hot and I was breaking out in a sweat before I even got to the building yeah but he wasn't apparently not no and and like I said the way he was dressed that's what caught my eye is like it's crazy you know they dressed that way and then it dawned on me not only was the coat but the trousers and the shoes I mean he was he he was dressed as a World War II sailor yeah, that's incredible. I that might be a good place to to uh, to I conclude think, for this evening. I think so. I think so. Uh, we appreciate everybody, and um, we'll be back next week. Absolutely. Happy Halloween season. Yes. Thanks, Josh. <laughs> thank you, Lisa, and thank you, Alex.